we're going to test out three resin printers, including one that's almost 10 times the price of the other two. I didn't expect to be suiting up in a hazmat suit. You know, I'm standing here wearing this get up in front of you guys and I'm wondering what the heck happened to me. I'm standing here with three resin 3D printers, the Elgu Mars, the Elgu Mars Pro, and the Zortrax Inkspire. The Elgu Mars is about $229 on Amazon, although the price fluctuates a bit with sales. The Mars Pro is 50 bucks more. And the Inkspire is almost 10 times the price at almost $2,000. Today we're going to test out each of these three printers, find out what they can do and how well they do it. We're also gonna to try to answer the burning question of the hour, is the Inkspire worth 10 times the price of the other two? Each of these machines is an SLA or stereolithography printer. Instead of solid plastic filament, they use a liquid resin. That's why I'm wearing this lab coat. Until the resin is cured with UV light, it's toxic as heck. I don't want any resin on my t-shirt or pants, even a tiny droplet, especially since I have a little dog who likes to climb up on daddy's lap. It's also why I'm standing in front of my garage door instead of in the fab lab with the FDM filament printers. The resin and the 99% isopropyl alcohol put out some pretty noxious fumes. This is the part of my shop where I work with paints and chemicals, and I can open the garage door to vacate the gases quickly and easily. Right now, let's talk about the printers in front of me. The Mars was introduced a few years ago to pretty much rave reviews, especially for the price. The Mars Pro moves the USB port to the front of the machine and adds a rubber gasket inside to help manage the fumes. Unfortunately, I found the gasket's fit and finish isn't perfect, although it does do the job. The company also tells us that the USB light's power and uniformity have improved over the Mars. Since this is what actually makes the plastic object, that improvement is worth considering. In addition to the gasket, the Mars Pro also adds a new filter, which should help to better contain those noxious fumes. The company added a new stepper motor and rail system that are supposed to reduce the noise and increase the print speed by a few points. Finally, a firmware upgrade is supposed to provide anti-aliasing, which should make for smoother prints. Jumping from about $300 to 10 bucks shy of $2,000, we come to the Inkspire. Unlike the two Mars devices, the Inkspire has both Ethernet and Wi-Fi networking built in. Zortrax's Z Suite software allows remote management of the printer, which could prove valuable in professional environments. While Raspberry Pi and Octoprint can do the same thing for filament printers for about 50 bucks or so, there are currently no plans for Octoprint to support resin printers. So remote printer management on the Inkspire may well be a substantial advantage worth the added cost, especially for print farms. Subjectively, the Inkspire is heavier and seems more sturdy than the other two Marses, but both of these are shockingly well built for a sub $300 printer. And here's where things get really confusing. All three machines have touchscreen interfaces. While the Mars and the Mars Pro have 120 by 68 by 155 millimeter total print area, the Inkspire isn't much larger. It's 132 by 74 by 174 millimeters, barely 10% more. The XY resolution of all three printers is about 21 pixels per millimeter, or a resolution of about 47 microns. Zortrax says its minimum layer height is 25 microns, where Elegoo says the Mars can attain a finer layer height of 10 plus microns. The plus is the question, of course. This is why performance testing is so important. That's next. All right, so this is how this is gonna go down. Um, my sound quality isn't gonna be quite as good as it normally is because I'm using a shotgun mic over there instead of the wireless lavalier I normally wear because I don't wanna get resin on my nice wireless mic. Uh, I'm obviously wearing lab coat gloves, the oh so sexy goggles, respirator and all that as I get ready to do the pour to pour the resin into um, the printer. Oh, and also, um, I'm not going to wear the respirator right now as I pour this so that I can talk to you. Um, for most of the offline stuff, I'm going to do that, and whew, the alcohol is such a nice smell. So anyway, 
these are chemical containment goggles, unlike the stuff that normally ships, because I don't want chemicals to come up around and into my eyes. Um, and one of the interesting things about the Mars, as opposed to the Mars Pro, is that it does not have a, uh, a maximum resin indicator. So I'm just pouring this stuff. Uh, I'm going to pour it to about a quarter. That looks like it should be okay. I'll put the cover back on, and then we'll start our first test print. So it's been about four and a half hours and the print has finished. Take the cover off. And I gotta say that once I took the cover off, the smell is definitely noticeable. So what we're gonna do is we're going to remove these objects from the cover, from the uh, build plate, and then, uh, and then clean them. And the stank is beginning to build up. It's not terrible, but it's definitely beginning to build up. All right. So I have a scraper. And now I'm actually going to start touching things that touch resin. So I need to be super careful. And I'm removing this unit. And here are the finished prints. Yeah, there we go. One. It's off. And as you can tell now, I have a bunch of things that are all pretty well contaminated. There we go, that's part two. To cover the resin, I printed this on the Ultimaker, but you can also get covers. The Mars did not come with a cover, but that fits pretty well, because I'm gonna come back later and do some more printing. Okay, I'm gonna start cleaning the resin off inside this unit. I'm just gonna shake it up a bit. These uh, latches allow that to happen without too much of a problem. So I'm hoping to do a first coat of cleaning the resin off. Meanwhile, I'm getting resin all around on the pickle tray itself. So all of these things are now contaminated. And here's where this becomes useful. I'm reaching in and somewhere inside the soap fuzz are the two parts. Now, have you kept track of the number of things I've contaminated so far? I've contaminated this, I've contaminated this, I've contaminated most of the things in the trays over there. They're all contaminated. And I should have had my, my goggles on for this. Huge, huge strategic mistake was my not putting the goggles on because when I was pushing down on that yep. part with these things, it could have snapped off. Likewise, if you're snipping away at supports, that could have snapped off. But I've been paying so much attention to making sure I could talk to you that I skipped the most essential step, which was to put the protective goggles because I don't want any of this resin in my eyes. So, and now I'm contaminated. So I'm gonna go through each of these things and do what I can to start cleaning off some of these parts. Okay. And you can begin to see why I'm using these trays because this stuff is messy as hell. I gotta tell you, when I went to computer science school, I did not expect to be suiting up in a hazmat suit to work on 3D printed models. Of course, when I went to computer science school, you couldn't do this, so this was way science fiction fantasy. But even so, but the fact is, is this is cool technology. I mean, we're, we're using light to create objects, and that's pretty neat. Okay, so this, by the way, is not fun, okay? I need to be clear, it's amazing, but it really isn't what I would consider a fun process. I mean, you've got to be pretty dedicated to making these, these little tiny things to put up with this kind of mess and stank. But, probably pretty worth it given how cool it is. Just be aware that everything you're touching, basically once you move into this zone here, you're talking contaminated goods. There's a lot of people on the internet who go ahead and do this stuff with bare hands and don't garb up and all that sort of stuff. And that's all well and good. 
But first off, I am incapable of eating a bowl of cold cereal without spilling it all over myself. So the idea that I'm going to be able to use toxic chemicals like this and not get it all over is pretty unrealistic. But the second is, is that I'm going to start dealing with chopping off all of this stuff, all of these supports and things, and uh, I don't want to scatter that into my eye or anywhere else. So I think having glasses on is a good idea. Right. So, well, that didn't go the way I expected. The $250 Elegoo Mars and the $300 Mars Pro performed perfectly. On the other hand, the nearly $2,000 Zortrax Inkspire failed miserably. I wasn't able to print a single model on the Inkspire successfully. For whatever reason, the Inkspire doesn't come with a sample print, so I don't even have a factory tuned model to print and show you. Over the course of a few days, I put 20 hours into the Inkspire with three failed prints, each taking about five hours, and another five or so hours fiddling with it and cleaning out the resin and residue from the failed prints. I tried a basic Benchy, then I tried the Foot Soldier model I used to test the Mars printers. When that failed using Zortrax's Z Suite, I tried it using the Inkspire profile from Chichu Box, the popular slicer that's used with the Mars printers. Nothing worked. Look, it's entirely possible that what we're seeing here is user error rather than product failure. This is my first time printing with resin, and while I followed Zortrax's directions exactly, it could be I'm missing something. I have reached out to the company, but unfortunately they haven't responded in time for my deadline. If they do get back to me and can show me the error of my ways, I'll do another video summarizing any new results. In the meantime, let's look at the two out of this world Mars printers. Print quality for tiny objects is impressive. To the naked eye, the prints that come out of both Mars devices seem more like castings than typical 3D prints with the layer lines and demic to filament printers. Here, you can see the rooks that serve as the sample prints for the Mars printers. They're quite impressive, although there does seem to be a small blemish at the bottom of the Mars Pro Rook. This could simply be an artifact of that individual print run. Zooming in with a macro lens, you can see the detail both Mars printers can produce. You can clearly see the double helix and staircase are rendered beautifully inside the Rooks. Zooming in even more, it's only once you look at the objects under the microscope that you begin to see any artifacts. That's pretty impressive. The detailed difference between filament and resin printers becomes even more apparent in this miniature foot soldier designed for support-free SLA printing by Thingiverse contributor Bright Minis. Here's the model printed with filament in 0.2 millimeter layer height on the CR10. Here's the same model in an 0.1 millimeter layer height printed using the high-res SL tool head on the Lulzbot Mini. Unfortunately, I ran out of gray filament and the bright green has less contract, contrast and it's harder to photograph. Even so, you can still see layer lines under the shield. By contrast, you can see the clean output from both the Mars and Mars Pro. From these, you can begin to see why SLA resin printers have such an appeal to miniature gamers, model railroaders, doll makers, and jewelry designers. Let's put the soldier under the microscope as well. Here you can see the big thick 0.2 millimeter filament layers in the hand and in the soldier's face. Again, it was a bit challenging to photograph the green filament, but you can see the layer lines. Now though, let's switch to the Mars printers. This is the hand and face on the Mars printer, and you can see the detail more than just the artifacts of the print process. While the hand isn't quite as nice on the Mars Pro, the facial detail is so complete you can even see the cheekbones. Remember, this is a very small model. Lincoln's head is just about the same size as the soldier's head, and the detail is similar. Finally, I decided to print a slightly bigger model, in this case the Enterprise NX-01 from Star Trek, by Thingiverse user ConP69. This print showcases both the wonder and challenge of 3D resin printing. Here's the front of the Enterprise. It looks pretty amazing for such a small print. Even zoomed in, the model is quite detailed. You only begin to see artifacting once you look at the model under the microscope. But that's on the top. I used the auto support tool from Cheetah Box to create a platform that would allow this model to print. On the side of the model with supports, you can see the pockmarks and blemishes left by the supports. That said, there are resin printer users who hand place each individual support pylon and get better results, but I'm not there yet. So there you go, after wallowing in toxic goo for a few weeks now, I have to say that resin printing is not a favorite activity for me. I like printing brackets and fixtures, which is the domain of FDM filament printers. That said, if I played games with miniatures, made models, or designed jewelry, the Mars printers would be an ideal choice. For $250 to $300, the quality of the Elegoo Mars prints is excellent. 
So is the build quality. These two printers are definite price performance value champions compared to nearly every other 3D printer I've looked at. As for whether you should get, <laughs> as for whether you should get the Mars or the Mars Pro, I recommend you get the Mars Pro if you can handle the extra 50 bucks. It's essentially the second generation printer and is worth the added cost. That said, I do have one complaint about both Mars printers. They don't come with any resin, not even a tiny amount to print a rook or two. Once the printers came in, I had to separately order and wait for resin to arrive. I know they're trying to keep costs down, but not being able to print even one model right out of the box is disappointing. As for the nearly $2,000 Inkspire, I can't recommend it. It supports a wide variety of resins, including specialty resins like those for dentistry, and will probably find a welcome home in some industrial applications, but it was a non-starter in my testing. I did reach out to the company, and if Zortrax responds with guidance that changes my results, I'll try to get back to you with an update. On a final note, Zortrax did provide an ultrasonic cleaner that came in handy cleaning the models printed on the Mars machines. The cleaner worked just fine, and I can definitely recommend it. Of course, at $299, the Zortrax ultrasonic cleaner is the price of the entire Mars Pro. There are also considerably less expensive and equally functional ultrasonic cleaners available on Amazon. So there you go. Getting started with resin printing can be relatively inexpensive with these Elegoo printers. Let me know in the comments below if you think this is something you're going to explore. Have you done SLA printing before? If you're a filament 3D printmaker, do you think you might expand your portfolio with a resin printer? I'd especially like to hear from miniature gamers, model makers, and jewelry designers. Do you agree with my assessment that a resin printer is ideal for your work? I'd also like to hear from anyone using resin printers for other kinds of projects. What else is a resin printer ideal for? Share your thoughts with everyone in the comments below. My name is David Gewertz for ZDNet's DIY IT. Go out there and make something cool. And please, oh please, after four takes, please make this one work. Please.